pray. Father, write the words on our hearts of your Bible in Jesus' name. Amen. So John chapter 1, verse 14, we'll just read a little bit after, just kind of give a little context here, where it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's going to be our verse, but we'll go on. For John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any, uh, any time. The only begotten of Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So, in our last, in our, in, 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 in our study so far, because this is the fifth time we're here on John, we have seen, we have continued on this one grand central subject of this chapter, which is really the grand central subject of the book of John, which is really the grand central subject of the Bible, it's Jesus Christ. And so, as he said in John 5, 39, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. No one can really understand the Bible unless they come to the Bible with one burning question. They want the Bible to answer this question, who is Jesus Christ? The Bible only has a value for a person when that person comes to the Bible and says, I want Jesus. Like the hymn says, more about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his fullness, full, saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me, more about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom, sure increase. More of his coming, Prince of Peace. And then the, the, the song goes on. More about Jesus, more about him. More, more about Jesus. That's what the Bible provides. The Bible provides more about Jesus. And in this first chapter, we have seen more about Jesus in verse 1 as the eternal one, more about Jesus in verse 1 as the, as the eternal God with the Father, more about Jesus in verse 1, uh, more about Jesus in verse 3 as the creator, more about Jesus in verse 4 as the true life, more about Jesus in verse 5 as the light, more about Jesus in verse 10 as, as, his, uh, as when he came to earth, more about Jesus in verse 11 as when he came to his own Jewish people. And when we come to verse 12, there was a great shift that took place from Jesus as to who he is to Jesus as to what he gives. And verse 12, we started to see more about Jesus the giver. So in verse 12, it was more about Jesus as he is the giver of the authority or the right for people to become sons and daughters of God to those who receive him. In verse 13, it was more about Jesus as the giver of a new birth to those who received him. And now as we move into verse 14, we continue on this theme about more about Jesus, the great giver, and here he is the giver of eternal life. In order for Jesus to give this eternal life, he must destroy death and, 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 and in order for death to be destroyed, it, because death entered the world by one man, by Adam, Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12 says, For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It's quite a statement. That it says that death passed upon, passed upon, all men, for they're all of sin. Death infected all men. You know, it reminds me of the time when, when, uh, when, my, when I, me and, 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 and two other colleagues from Scandibodies, we were in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. We happened to be there, we happened to find ourselves there for a day. We had errands to do, and so we had to do things in the capital there before we went down to our compound about three hours south. So we had this afternoon free because uh, you can't travel at night because uh, the band, uh, you know, bandits and all that. 
uh, on the road down south, so we, 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 we couldn't go. So we, we had an afternoon free. We didn't have enough time to get there before dark. So we decided to visit the, um, this special hospital. Uh, I think it was called the Mother Teresa Hospital for Children with AIDS. And our, 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 our managing director uh, at Scan Bodies Ethiopia, Fasika, uh, she had told us about this place because she had attended the Catholic University there and in her studies, she had studied children, she just studied AIDS. And the government says in Ethiopia that only 4% of the population have AIDS. Well, her part as her university studies was to, to go from mud hut to mud hut and interview the people there and get a sampling and find out what, what the real rate was, which is 24%, very high. And it also, that means that in Ethiopia, there are many, many children with AIDS. They, the government says 135,000, much higher, I'm sure. But anyway, on this afternoon, we went to this hospital that she told us about, which is also a school with a playground for, for it's all children with AIDS. And the children there are, are dying from AIDS. And um, there, are hundred, there were hundreds of children there. And they all uh, were, knew that, they, that there were different stages of AIDS before death. I mean, first there was the group or the stage of the children that were still strong enough to play on the playground, and they were playing on the playground. And we had a, we had a guide, a, a child with AIDS, who was taking us around and who was older. And anyway, and then there's a group that could no longer have the strength to play, and they were sitting and watching the kids play. And then there was another group, and they, they, were, they, they couldn't even do that. They were confined to their rooms uh, b b because they were weak. And then last, there was the group that was in the hospital there, and they were dying from AIDS, and children died every day from AIDS. As a matter of fact, I remember two children died while we were there. And it was just so sad to see these children to, uh, and to talk with these children, which we did for that afternoon, uh, because they, as our guide was taking us around, and, and, uh, and as he was, he was telling us very openly about his little friends that had died from, from AIDS. And he told us uh, that it was a common occurrence for the kids to gather around and bow their heads in remembrance of, of someone who just passed away. And, and they showed us a memorial with the names of the kids there. It was, it was, it was it just, the whole experience just broke our hearts. I mean, none of us took any pictures you know, or videos of that. It was just so surreal, it was unbelievable. Kids being cut down in the prime of their lives by this disease. And, and, and the thing is about these kids, none of these kids did any immoral act that, that, that gave them AIDS. They all contracted AIDS from their mothers. And, and those children all inherited the HIV AIDS disease from their mothers. And so all of those children knew that they had a fatal disease. They knew that. And, and, and that was going to kill them. And they, and they lived with that knowledge every day as they saw their little friends succumb to the disease that they had. And I was, and, and I was there, I, I, I was thinking to myself, we are all like those children. We all have a fatal disease, it's called sin. And it's gonna kill us. And we all live with the knowledge every day that we see our friends and our family succumb to this disease of sin. And the fatal disease of, of sin, we inherited that disease. We, like those kids, we got that from our parents who are all descendants of one man, Adam, who brought this fatal disease into the world of sin and death, and it's been passed on to all people. That's Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12, where, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And, and all of us, all of us, like it or not, we perpetuate this, the infection of this fatal disease of sin, and, and, and we also perpetuate by our own personal sins. So as we were at that hospital, we, we wished that there was some cure that could take this HIV AIDS away from these children. And in the same way, God looked at us with our fatal disease of sin, and he wished for some cure that could take our fatal disease of sin away from us. 
And God found the cure. God found a way, a cure from our fatal disease of sin. That, 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 that and, it, and it all meant back, it all had to go back to the source of sin, man. Man sinned and brought death into the world. And so God, in order for this cure, God needed another man in the world, a new man, a man that was disease-free, sin disease-free, a man that had never sinned, a man that, that never sinned and would, would take the penalty of sin on himself and he would die the death of sin, not having the disease of sin himself, but dying not for his sins, but for the sins of others, and that would be the death of sin, and that would be the cure of this fatal disease of sin. But there was no man who did not have that fatal disease of sin. There was no child in that hospital that didn't have HIV AIDS. There was no man who had never sinned. So God decided he would have to become that man who would be the cure for sin and death. As the Bible says in Romans 8, 2, Romans 8, 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Flesh, flesh, flesh was needed. The cure from sin, Romans 8.3, Romans 8.3, is God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Sin had to be condemned in the flesh. So Jesus Christ is God the Son. He came in the flesh so that he could cure, cure man from his sin and death. And this is what happened in verse 14. Verse 14, the word was made flesh. And, and the word made in the Greek means became, became. So God became flesh. God became a man. And that's what verse 14 is telling us. The word was made flesh. And because the word was made flesh, we had and have, had and have, an opportunity to see God, see God's word translated into a human form. Because John 1.14, when it says the word was made flesh, it's a description of a transformation of God's word into a human form so that people could see what God is, what God's word means. The word was made flesh was like a translation you know, just as the Bible is written in, in languages that, that most cannot understand in, in Hebrew and Greek, the Bible is therefore translated into our language of English so that we can understand it. And in the same way, God is not understandable to us. But when the Word was made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, then we could understand God because Jesus Christ is like the translation of God into a form that we can understand, which is why Jesus Christ said in John 14, 9, John 14, 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And what Jesus Christ meant by that when he said he that has seen me has seen the Father is that Jesus Christ is the translation of God the Father into a form that we can understand. That's the impact behind verse 14 when it says the word was made flesh. We needed, John 1, 14, we needed the word to be made flesh in order for us to understand God. From the life of Jesus Christ, we're able to understand who God is through Jesus Christ. That's why, in a sense, in a sense, we should make John 1, 14 a prayer for ourselves. In John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. We should ask God, Make our lives to be a translation of the Bible so that God would make us to be, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. It reminds me of a boy, <coughs> a boy that was selling apples at Grand Central Station 
in New York City. And at this time, a train was packed with people, and it had just arrived. And the boy wanted to sell his apples, so he got as close as he could to the arriving passengers as they came off the train. And the arriving passengers in New York City you know, were in a hurry, and so they stormed out of the, pl the train as the doors opened. And, and, and the boy was in, the, was in their way, and so he got knocked down by the passengers, and his apples went flying all over the floor of Grand Central Station. And the boy just stood there in shock. He was heartbroken. And a man who was a passenger on the train, he saw what happened, and he went and collected all the apples for that boy and brought it back to the boy. And the boy was so amazed that he looked up in the man's face and he had one question. He said, sir, are you Jesus Christ? <laughs> the boy said that. Why did the boy say that to the man? Are you Jesus Christ? Because when that man, in his kindness, picked up those apples for the boy, that boy, in, that, 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 that boy saw in that man, in that act, that that man had become John 1.14, John 1.14. The Word became flesh. The Word was made flesh. And the boy saw Jesus Christ in that man, and he asked that that man was Jesus Christ. That's what God wants to have happen in our lives. God wants us to be, John 1.14, the Word was made flesh. So the people will ask us, are you Jesus Christ? This is what they asked John the Baptist. And that's what Christ meant when he said in John 5.14, John 5.14, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What Christ meant was that in our lives, we should become, John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh. Now, from the start of sin and death, God made a promise. He made a promise that He would become flesh. And, 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 and when God said to the serpent, who brought, who brought the temptation, to enticed man to sin, and God said, right after man had sinned, Genesis 3.15, God said these words, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. If you would have told those children at that HIV AIDS hospital there in Addis that a cure for their fatal disease was coming, those kids would hold on to that as a bright, shining hope. They would encourage each other as a reminder that a cure was coming. Not long, it would be there. Just a little longer, just a little longer. And that's what it was like for Adam and Eve when they heard that the Deliverer was going to come. And they understood that the Deliverer from the fatal disease of sin and death was going to be the Word made flesh. It was going to be God Himself that was come. They understood that the Savior person of Genesis 3.15, the one who's going to crush the head of, the, of Satan, the, the one who has the power over death, the, person, the head crusher is going to be God Himself. And they knew that. And Eve revealed that she knew that by what she said when she delivered her firstborn. Eve knew that the crusher of the devil's head was going to be one of her seed and that it was going to be God who became a man. It was going to be the word that became flesh. Because when, when Eve had her first son, Cain, Eve thought that Cain was the one. She thought, she is my seed and, and, and he's God who's become a man. Because when Cain was born, she said in Genesis 4.1, Genesis 4.1, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. What the Eve literally said in the Hebrew is kaniti ish et Yehovah, which literally means I have gotten a man 
who is God. Eve thought that Cain was the man who was God. She was dead wrong. She was very wrong. Cain was the farthest thing from the man who was God. But when, but when Eve said about Cain, I have gotten a man who is God, that showed that Adam and Eve understood that God would become a man who would destroy sin, who would destroy death, and that was their hope that they were hanging on to. Now, it was thousands of years later before a descendant of Eve named Mary could say the, the truth. She could say, Kaniti ish et Yehovah. Thousands of years later, a young virgin girl gave birth to her son in a barn, and she could say the words, I have gotten a man who is God. Those thousands of years later is what the Bible calls the fullness of time in Galatians 4.4. Galatians 4.4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And that was when it happened, John 1.14, John 1.14, the word was made flesh. Now in verse 14, the word was made flesh, it, 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 that was necessary because of the two verses before, verses 12 and 13. Because tw verses 12 and four, 13 of John 1 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God the Father wanted for those who receive Jesus Christ to really become sons and daughters of God. So, and so they experience a new birth as sons and daughters of God. This was new. But there was just one problem. They all still had the fatal disease of sin and death. And they needed to be cured from that disease of sin and death. And the only way for those newly born sons and daughters of God to be fully cured from this, the disease of sin and death was verse 14. That's why it follows. The word was made flesh. The only way for those newly born sons and daughters of God to have eternal life and be cured from the sin and death was if Jesus Christ became like them and died like them. And so he destroyed sin and death, as it says in Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So the promise originally given way back in Genesis 3.15, that it would be the seed of the woman, fully man, as God would become a man and would be the one of Hebrews 2.14, Hebrews 2.14, who would destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so Jesus Christ became a partaker of flesh and blood. And all the weaknesses, because when you say flesh, you're talking weakness. All the weaknesses of flesh, including the weakness of dying like a normal person dies in weakness, but without sin, he had no sin. So that through his death, he would crush the head of, of, of the person who had the power of death, that is the devil. And when Jesus Christ was made flesh, he was made weak as flesh is weak, as stated in 2 Corinthians 3.14, 2 Corinthians 3.14, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Especially on the cross, Jesus Christ was weak, as he said in that he in his weakness and his thirst on the cross, his weakness on the cross is seen graphically in Psalm 22, 14. Psalm 22, 14. This is a description of weakness. Psalm 22, 14, where he said, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. 
My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. When Christ was on the cross in Psalm twenty-two, fourteen, 14, it says that he was poured out like water. Christ was speaking of the weakness of dying from dehydration, which is what killed him. When Christ on the cross said in, in, in Psalm twenty-two fourteen 14, that his heart was melted in the middle of his body, he was speaking of the weakness of being out of breath from lack of oxygen because his heart was not pumping enough blood to his lungs. When Christ on the cross said in Psalm twenty-two fourteen 14, that all his, all his bones were out of joint, he was speaking of the weakness of just not being able to support his body. The bone system is a, is a scaffold of the body. It's a frame that supports the body. And he, was, says, he said, my scaffold, my frame is too, too weak to support me. When Christ said on the cross in Psalm 22, 15, that his strength was dried up like a broken piece of pottery, he was saying that he was speaking of a weakness of having no resources, no, no strength resources to draw on. And when Christ said in Psalm 22, 15, Psalm 22, 15, that his tongue was plastered to the, to the roof of his mouth, he was speaking of the weakness of not even being able to talk. And when Christ on the cross said in Psalm 22, 16, Psalm 22, 16, that his hands and his feet had been pierced, he was speaking of the weakness from being exhausted from in, in, enduring excruciating pain. Pain is, it, 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 it takes the strength out of you. It just, it, it, it exhausts, pain is exhausting. And so Psalm 22 is a description of the weakness of Christ on the cross. I think that uh, uh, of the many scenes in The Chosen, the one that really also did impress me was when Christ was healing on this day and all these people were coming to him. And finally, at the end of the day, he's, he's barely able to drag himself back and he, he said, the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest or whatever they're arguing about. And he just says to them, good night. And he just passes by, you know, and he goes in there and then you get a close-up of him. He's got blood on his tunic. Somebody had been bleeding on him, you know. And, and, and it was weakness. It was very clear. And that was necessary for Christ to experience that weakness which came from verse 14. And the word was made flesh. The word was made weakness. Flesh is weakness. Because in his state of weakness, he triumphed. In 2 Corinthians 13, 4, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. And so this is the, this is the impact of the word was made flesh because of Hebrews 2, 14, which says that we are partakers of flesh and blood. He had to take the same. He had to be tarped. So that in our place, as a sinless one, he could not only die for our sins, but he destroys him that has the power of death. It was monumental in, in John 1.14. Monumental, the word was made flesh because Jesus Christ, as the eternal, immortal God, becomes flesh, which is weak and dying. But this is what God said he, he did. In Psalm 78.39, Psalm 78.39, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind, that passes the way and comes not again. And he did it. Jesus Christ did it in John 1.14 when the word was made flesh. He did it because that was the only way that he could bring us to God. He had to be put to death in the weakness of flesh in order to bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18, 1 Peter 3.18. Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He did it in John 1.14. The Word was made flesh. He died for us in the weakness of flesh. And it was so hard for him that he prayed before being put to death in weakness, in the weakness of the flesh. He prayed in Matthew 26.39. Matthew 26.39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not as I will, but as thou wilt. So verse 14 is so astounding. The word was made flesh. It was a great triumph of the will of Christ to be made in the weakness of flesh, to die in the weakness of flesh so that he could, so that he could 1 Peter 3.18, 1 Peter 3.18, bring us to God. It was so hard for him. And now that he's done it, and now that he knows all the horrors that, by experience, that he went through being crucified in the weakness, he now says, if he had to do it again to bring us to God, he'd do it again. He'd do it again. But he doesn't have to do it again. Because 1 Peter 3.18, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Never again will Christ have to suffer this death of the cross in weakness to bring us to God. It's already once for all, once for all, Hebrews 9.26, Hebrews 9.26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once for all, that was all that's necessary for Christ to suffer to bring us to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made him to be sin for us, that we might, that who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now that he suffered for the, the, the death on the cross and the weakness of his flesh, we just look at it, we just marvel, we just gaze, we just look at this. We marvel how the eternal word was made flesh. The same flesh that God said to Noah about man in Genesis 6.3. Genesis 6.3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And we say the words of the hymn, and can it be? And can it be? We marvel at how Christ, uh, 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 who made all things, should make himself flesh. Philippians 2.5, Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him. He took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We read something like that and we say, and can it be? Can it really be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We marvel at how Christ could have made himself to be what was the farthest distance from himself in heaven. Isaiah 40, verse 6, Isaiah 40, verse 6, the voice said, cry, and, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because it's the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, and he should become grass. And we say the words, and can it be that thou, my God, should make yourself to be like grass that withers and fades in the death? It's a mystery. In, 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 in verse 14, verse 14, the word was made flesh. Verse 14 is, is the mystery of God becoming a man. Verse 14 is the mystery of the Son of God becoming the Son of Man. Verse 14 is the mystery of the eternal word becoming a baby. Verse 14 is the mystery of the life becoming a, a, a mortal man. Verse 14 is the mystery of the eternal light in the middle of darkness. We can't get over that. The impact behind verse 14, the word was made flesh. <coughs> and then we read in verse 14 what he did when he became flesh. It says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. Now, after Christ was made flesh, he didn't isolate himself in some cave like a monk you know, waiting for the time when he would just have to come out and be the sacrifice for sins. We read that Christ became flesh. He dwelt among us. He dwelt among us when he was born as a child unto us. Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born. Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 7, 14, before the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name 
Emmanuel, which is God with us. Christ dwelt among us when he was a child in the house of Mary and Joseph, when it says in Luke 2.51, Luke 2.51, he went down unto them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. And he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He dwelt among us when as a man he, 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 he went to sleep uh, among his disciples in Mark 4.38, Mark 3.48, he was in the hinder part of the boat asleep on a pillow. He dwelt among us when he voluntarily suffered among men. In, in Matthew 26, 53, Matthew 26, 53, he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? He dwelt among us when he voluntarily died among men. John 10, 18, John 10, 18, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. He dwelt among us when he said that he was going to die, and that he, and, 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 but, but he wasn't going back to heaven alone. John 12, 24, John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it biteth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. We are the fruit that he's bringing with him. So, verse 14 is not a statement that, 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 that says, and the word was made flesh and, and dwelt among man. It doesn't say that. Verse 14 is so personal because it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And by you using the word us, it means you and I. And when we read about the acts of Jesus among his disciples, by using the word us, in verse 14, it's like saying that we lived with Jesus. Uh, we, we lived among, uh, among the disciples. We, we were there vicariously living in the lives of the disciples. That's what God does for us in the Bible. God makes us to identify so closely with those in the Bible who lived among Jesus that the us in verse 14 becomes our own personal experience. John 1, 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We see ourselves as Peter. When Peter says in Luke 1, 5, 8, Luke 5, 8, we're saying, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me, I am a sinful man. We see ourselves in Thomas. When Thomas said to Christ in John 20, 28, John 20, 28, Thomas answered and said unto me, my Lord and my God. God makes the Bible so real to us that we become the us in verse 14 and experience personally in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word us opens up a wonder for us. As we think of a, a, another word that could have been there for us. It could, what, what if verse 14 read? It doesn't, but what if it read, and the word became flesh and dwelt among angels? But it doesn't say that. And that's the wonder of the word, not just man, but us. Because it's to us that Jesus Christ became flesh and he, tw he chose to dwell among us. And he's still doing that today as Emmanuel, God with us. He's dwelling among us. He chose to dwell in our lower world among us. When the Bible says in that verse in Philippians 2.7, Philippians 2.7, he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That means that he chose to put himself, to be made in the same mold as us and to live in the same world as us. He had no personal need to dwell among us. He got nothing by choosing to dwell among us. I mean, we're, we were corrupt. We were degraded. We were revolting against God. And the Bible says that, that, that Christ chose to dwell among us as the rebellious ones. Psalm 68, 18. Psalm 68, 18. Thou, where it says, David talking to God, Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. He's talking about dwelling among the rebellious. That's us. And when the announcement was made 
to the Jewish people that Jesus Christ was going to come and dwell among them, God made a call to the Jewish people that they should sing and rejoice over that in Zechariah 2.10. Zechariah 2.10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And even though the vast majority of the Jewish people did not care that he came to them, did not want Jesus Christ to dwell among them, because of John 1.11, John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Nevertheless, nevertheless, that did not stop Jesus Christ from coming and dwelling among the Jewish people. And the Greek word that's translated here, dwell, is eskinu. And eskinu means to camp in a tent. To camp in a tent. That's how the stay of Jesus Christ is described on earth, with eskino, camping in a tent. When Christ came to earth and dwelt among us, he had all the riches of the universe, but when he came to earth, he didn't live in a palace. He didn't live in a house. His stay on earth is described in verse 14 as camping in a tent. Another word for the word tent is tabernacle. And a tabernacle tent was how God chose to live among the Jewish people in the desert for 40 years. When he said, when God said to Moses in Exodus 25, 8, Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then when Moses was directed to make this sanctuary, it was a tent. It was nothing, it was a tent out there already. It was a tabernacle in the desert. And that's how Abraham chose to live his life on earth. Abraham was a very rich man. He could have built for himself a big hacienda grande. Could have been really impressive. But instead he chose to live in a tent because Abraham never felt at home on earth. And that's why he lived in tents in, Roman, uh, in Hebrews 11.8. Hebrews 11.8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should afterward receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise that is in a strange country, dwelling in tents, tabernacles, tents, with Isaac and Jacob, with heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And, in, and Abraham didn't find that city on earth, so he just kept on living in these tents. And that's why God calls us to be Galatians 3.7, Galatians 3.7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. We are to follow Abraham who lived in tents because he knew this world is not his home. And that means for us we need to be ready to let it all go. Release it all and turn to go to heaven. Don't look back like Lot's wife did. Why? Because of Hebrews 13, 14, Hebrews 13, 14, 13, 14. Here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Not like Lot's wife, where it says in Genesis 19, 26, Genesis 19, 26, his wife looked back from behind him. She became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife thought in Sodom she has a continuing city for her. She loves Sodom. And that's why she turned back, and that's why she became the pillar of salt. Reminds me of what's happening right now to us in Ethiopia. For 13 years, we have built up our 12-acre compound in Budajir, Ethiopia, to be the most beautiful place, I think, in Ethiopia. We've invested over $8 million in building up that site. We don't believe there's any place like it in Ethiopia. We've got 1,500 flourishing fruit trees. We brought over plumerias. We built, fount we have fountains there. It's beautiful dining facilities, guest houses, guest houses for 40 people with furniture and bathroom fixtures and beds all shipped over in 12 large containers from San Diego. Each of those bedrooms has been customized to be like home sweet home. I mean, we really put our heart into beautifying that place. And God bless that site. He made us to have there the largest producing well of well water, well of fresh water in Ethiopia with 300 gallons per minute. It's just a beautiful compound. Three years ago, 
tribal civil war started in Ethiopia. It may be, because the internet and the phones have been cut down, it may be that a million people have been killed in this tribal war. And the U.S. State Department has warned us, warned U.S. citizens, don't come. But if you do come, don't leave the capital. Because with no internet and no phone, the U.S. has no way to keep U.S. citizens track of them or keep them safe. Moreover, the Ethiopian government has boxed us into a corner with demands that we resume business. How can we resume business as tribal warfare and, and, and pay them unreasonable taxes that they have come up with? And it's reached a point now where in 12 days we are forced to surrender our business license. The government will come in and auction off everything that's there so that they can collect the monies that they think we owe them for the last three years when we haven't operated the business. How do we feel about that? Like Abraham, with his tent mentality. This world's not our home. Let him take it. Let it go. Bert Poole's song says it best in hymn number 587 in our hymnal, where it says, It tried to woo me and to pursue me. My affections captivate and lead me on. Then my love it tried to steal with alluring sense appeal. Till the Savior won my heart with Calvary love. Let it go. Let it go by. Let it go by. Let the world go swiftly by. I don't need it. I don't want it. For the chill of death is in its beckoning cry. Draw me nearer, blessed Savior, close enough to shelter from the tempter's skill. Let me read the holy word, pray until thy voice I heard, and let the fickle world out there go passing by. Oh, that's great words. Oh, boy. That's how Jesus Christ is described in his stay when he came to earth, as camping in a tent. Who camps in a tent? Who camps in a tent? Shepherds camp in tents. Shepherds camp in tents so they can move with their sheep. David said in Psalm 23, 1, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And as a matter of fact, Jesus Christ said it out about himself in John 10, 14, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. Know my sheep and known of mine. Christ is the shepherd. Shepherds camp in tents. Christ's day on earth is described as living in a tent. Who else lives in a tent? Who else is in a tent? Soldiers. Soldiers live in tents. Just like when that dedicated soldier, Uriah, was invited by David to go to your home for the night. 2 Samuel 11, 11, 2 Samuel 11, 11, Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord encamped in the open fields. Shall I go home into my own house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Soldiers live in tents. In Genesis 3, 15, Jehovah Jesus said, I am a soldier. And he declared war against Satan and death. In Hosea 13, 14, Hosea 13, 14, he said, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. And Jehovah Jesus is described as a warrior. In Isaiah 42, 13, Isaiah 42, 42, 13, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. When Christ came to earth, he was dressed in flesh, and, 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 and he just didn't have any stunning beauty about him. Isaiah 53, 2, Isaiah 53, 2 says, he has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. That's how most people saw Jesus Christ. No particular impressive form, no impressive beauty, just a common looking person. But that's not how all people saw Jesus Christ. Because there was a group of people who are described in verse 14. Verse 14 and the, verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The we in verse 13, verse 14, verse 14, saw something different 
about Jesus Christ. It was they who saw his glory, the glory of Jesus Christ. The reason they saw what others did not see because of one word. One word in verse 14 that made all the difference of those who saw his glory and those who didn't. And it's the word beheld. They beheld. The Greek word translated as beheld means literally to look closely at, to examine very carefully. They saw the glory of Jesus Christ because they looked carefully at Jesus Christ. That's why they saw what others did not see. The problem for others is that when they saw Jesus Christ, their response was Isaiah 53.3. Isaiah 53.3. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He's despised and we esteemed him not. When they saw Jesus Christ, they covered their faces so they couldn't look at him. Isaiah 53 was a response of, we hid as it were our faces from him. They refused to look. They were the, for the, they, they were the farthest from looking carefully at Jesus Christ. They'd rather die than examine carefully Jesus Christ. And that's the way it is today. That's the way it is today. In Loretto, in Mexico, when I'm with a Jewish person, I sit down and I'll do anything to just, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. And when I suggest something like that and you look on the faces, it's just like I said, let's get a root canal without an anesthetic. <laughs> it's, it's a look of shock. But, I sit, but if I sit there now and I, say, I said, look, you know, why don't we look at an episode of The Chosen, uh, the TV series, and discuss Jesus Christ and they said, no, we don't have time for that. No. Because there is the refusal to behold in verse 14. And because of that refusal to look carefully at Jesus Christ, there's no seeing the magnificent glory of Jesus Christ. It's all lost. Similar to what Jesus Christ said in John 5.40, John 5.40, you will not come to me that you might have life. Just as there's no seeing the glory of Jesus Christ without beholding him in a close examination, there's no living forever after death without coming to Jesus Christ. And just as the Bible is all about Jesus Christ, so all the glory of God and all the eternal life is all about Jesus Christ. And the glory that was seen by those who took the time to behold, look carefully, what they saw was a certain radiant brightness that's described in verse 14. Verse 14, the word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory that they, they beheld, what they saw, was the glory of a person who is God the Son, who's described as, verse 14, verse 14, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. They saw in that glory of Jesus Christ that there was a person who was full of grace and truth. Moses delivered the truth. Moses delivered the law. He delivered the law to Israel. He did not deliver grace. Moses delivered, in essence, Ezekiel 18.20, Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But only Jesus Christ brought the grace of God. Titus 2.11, Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What people saw in the glory of Jesus Christ, when they took the time to behold him, look at him carefully, they saw grace and truth. They saw a perfect, sinless life in Jesus Christ. That was the truth part. They saw the translation of the law of God in a person. That was Jesus Christ. They'd never seen that on earth since Adam sinned. What the truth looks like in a perfect, sinless person. But in Jesus Christ, they saw that truth. They saw the glory of God, full of truth. But yet, when they beheld and looked closely at Jesus Christ, they not only saw the glory of the truth, they also saw, which is the glory of a sinless person, they also saw that this person did, was not condemning them, that this person was welcoming dirty, rotten sinners to come to him to be cleansed and forgiven. That's the full of grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we behold him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.